All right, Irving Church, welcome to our very first live session of the Irving Church video thingies. No, that is not the name that we chose for these things. We are going to reveal that at the end of this Bible study. I'm here with Terry, and we are going to be continuing the Thessaf Thessalonian. Thessalonian study that we've been going through on Sunday mornings. Make sure to post your comments and all of your questions in the feed, and we are going to get to those later in the study. So make sure that there's plenty of questions to be asked. Without any further ado, here is the man himself. Good morning, everyone. Glad you could be with us today. And we have been, since January, actually, we've been studying First Thessalonians. And the mic's not working. All right. We knew there were going to be some glitches. We had no idea that it would happen so quickly. Anyway, good morning. We're glad that you could join us. Sorry for the interruption there. Uh, we have been studying 1 Thessalonians ever since January. We've been taking our time and working through the book. We've had a lot of interest uh, here at Irving Church and once we got quarantined, one of the things that I was saddened about is that we, we were uh, not able to be together and study First Thessalonians. Uh, we've really had some great studies and a wonderful time together. And so we just thought, hey, uh, we're, we're doing some videos and we might as well just uh, go Facebook Live with our study. We have been studying, like I said, since January, and so we're on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to study the last six verses, verses 13 through 18. And I'm so happy to have my partner in crime here, uh, Brother Steve Orton, with us today. Thank you, Terry, and welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you're here. You know, Luke said on Tuesday, what great hair you have, Terry, and I have to agree with him, it even looks better this morning. So since we've been quarantined, I thought it would be a good idea for me to let my hair grow out, so maybe people will come to me for some hair care advice. Well, we don't know, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. No, in actuality, I won't leave this on and be comic relief the whole time, but um, you know, that, it, that hair though I did determine or find out does keep your head really warm, and so I, I kind of miss that. <laughs> Like Terry said, we're uh, continuing our study of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting with verse 13, but we realize that many of you aren't kind of caught up to speed. Maybe you're joining us for the first time. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background information. The church at Thessalonica was started um, in Acts, it's recorded in Acts the 17th chapter, where Paul receives the Macedonian vision and he goes to the northern part of Greece, or the province of Macedonia, and meets at uh, Philippi first. He gets persecuted there and beaten and thrown into prison. And then when he's released the next day, he and Silas and Timothy are ushered out of town. The authorities say, hey, we, you're a Roman citizen. We could get in trouble for persecuting you, so you go on your way. Just please leave our town. So Paul and Timothy and Silas then travel to Thessalonica. Today it's known as Thessaloniki. Uh, but the, uh, in that place, Paul, it says, met on the Sabbath day in the synagogue for three different Sabbaths. And then shortly after that, many people were starting to hear about Jesus and come to Jesus and follow him and accept him as God's anointed, God's Messiah. And uh, with that, Many people then got jealous, and so they raised up a mob, and they tried to find Paul, but when he couldn't be found, they grabbed a hold of one of the leaders there among the Jesus followers by the name of Jason, and they uh, drug him before the authorities and then began to persecute him, saying, these people have turned our world upside down. And so the brothers said, wow, this is bringing a lot of persecution. Paul, you better leave. And so they went down to Berea. 
the uh, Thessalonians or Thessalo Thessalonians, some of them who were pagans or from a different religious background, came down and continued to persecute Paul and Silas and Timothy in Berea. And so Paul had to then even leave and go to Athens, and eventually he made his way to Corinth. But he was so worried about the Thessalonian, the young fledgling church among the Thessalonian brothers that he only had a short time to be with, that he wanted to know about their welfare. He wanted to make sure that this persecution wasn't hurting them and that they weren't giving up their faith or love for God and love for Jesus and love for one another. So he sends Timothy back to find information about them. How are they doing? And Timothy comes back while Paul is at Corinth and gives him a report. They're doing well. They're staying strong. They're keeping the faith. They're loving the Lord and loving one another. And so Paul sends Timothy back with this letter of encouragement uh, to keep them, to encourage them to keep on keeping on and stay true to the Lord Jesus. And that's what this letter is about. Well, this is a passage that's caused people a, a lot of difficulty. It's not an easy passage uh, to work through. We're going to give it our best shot today. Uh, in just a few moments, I'm going to read through the passage, but I want to set things up just a little bit and don't want to uh, bore you with a lot of history, but sometimes understanding the socio-historical background of a letter actually goes a long way in helping us to understand certain verses or passages or concepts that we find in the letter. And that's going to be true as we go through this, so that's why I want to bring up a couple of things. The city of Thessalonica was actually very dependent on Rome. Part of the way that Rome kept their empire under control was that they were a patron city. In other words, as other cities had been conquered, they would uh, do any number of things to try to keep them under control. And one of the things they would do with certain cities is they would support them financially. They would give them all kinds of advantages and provisions. But there's a catch to that. There were strings attached. In order for Rome to really bless the city and help them like this, they actually had to do whatever Rome wanted them to do. And so it was like, we'll give you the money, but we're going to control what you do. And part of that control was that we don't want any problems. We don't want any revolts. We don't want any uprisings. We don't want any fighting. And so all of that plays into this. And so you can imagine, like as Steve pointed out in Acts chapter 17, when there was a disturbance and when people were upset at Paul's preaching and drove him out of town and all that kind of thing, there's going to be city officials, there's going to be other people there that are going to be thinking, oh, no, uh, we we got to quiet this thing down, we can't let this happen, what's Rome going to do if they find out there's trouble here? Because historically... Uh, a number of years earlier, they had had such a problem, and they had been, uh, they had received some uh, punitive measures from Rome that had withdrawn uh, a lot of the good things. And now they had got all of these things back. They were in good favor with Rome, and they sure wanted to keep it that way. One of the things I want to mention briefly from chapter 1, verse 9, uh, early on in our study, Paul writes, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living God. So that's one of the big things that happened when the gospel hit Thessalonica was that this pagan city uh, whose inhabitants believed in and worshipped all kinds of gods and goddesses from the whole Greco-Roman uh, culture uh, they were turning people away from those gods to serve the true God, the living God. And very prominent among the gods in that city was the emperor. That's right. There was an emperor's cult in Thessalonica, and they had a temple there. 
And part of the whole patronage deal, pleasing Rome, making Rome happy, was to have the imperial cult up front and prominent at Thessalonica. And so some of what we're going to see in this passage, as you're going to see shortly, some of what we're going to read actually has some references to a very overriding and critical message that Paul is making to the Thessalonians that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. I want you to keep that in mind as we go through some of this and some of the imagery and things we're going to talk about will have a lot to do with that. So open your Bibles up. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 13 through 18, and then we're going to have some comments uh, from our brother Steve. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and the voice of the archangel and with a trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Steve? Well, thank you, Terry. Let's go back to verse 13. And my translation of it may be slightly different, but you might benefit from both. Paul said... We don't want you to be uninformed or ignorant or unknowledgeable, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you do not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. You know, Paul didn't want them to be uninformed. He didn't want them to be without knowledge because knowledge helps us deal with life and with reality. So it's never a good thing to be ignorant about any topic, but especially concerning those things which you can't experience or gain experiential knowledge on your own. Some of that has to come from revelation. And we'll see that that's how Paul received much of his knowledge regarding this topic. You know, we talked about the fact that the church at Thessalonica was persecuted. So it's very likely that many of the people at that church were, being, were seeing death, maybe being killed in the tribulation, Maybe they were just being harassed and dying of natural causes. But for whatever reason, they were seeing death and experiencing it. And Paul felt like this is something that they needed some knowledge and information about. Because it would be important to them that they know about not only death, but what is in store after death so that they could deal with the realities of life in death and dying. So he said, I don't want you to be uninformed about this topic, especially if there were those of you who are experiencing it in your family of loved ones dying, that you don't sorrow or grieve like those who have no hope when one is asleep. I thought it was interesting that Paul uses some of the same references to death and dying that even Jesus did in John the 11th chapter, when his brother, his friend, Lazarus, was sick, he told his disciples in John 11 that he would, he would go back to Bethany where they were earlier trying to kill Jesus. And his disciples said, why would you want to go back there? And he said, my friend Lazarus is sleeping. And they said, well, all the more, don't go and wake him up because uh, he needs his sleep and that will, then he'll recover. But Jesus told them plainly, no, I'm not talking about just slumber and sleep. I'm talking, when I use that term, about death. Lazarus has died. But Jesus knew that that was 
that death is a temporary state for those who love, believe, and trust and follow him. And so he said, Lazarus sleepeth. He knew that life, restoration of life was coming not only to Lazarus, his soul and his spirit, which still existed, but also to the body that had ceased functioning. So Paul uses the same language. I don't want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, so that you don't grieve like other people who have no hope. Now listen, we all know that when death comes in our family, to people we love and we want to be with us, that is sorrow. It's a lot of sorrow. Many people are experiencing that right now, that right now in their families in this pandemic. And while we have sorrow when we lose loved ones and problems come into our life and we lose a mother, a father, a child, we grieve. And that's normal and expected. But we don't grieve like people who have no hope, right. like the pagans, like people who have no hope of tomorrow. So Paul didn't want their grief, which was he knew was a temporary thing, he didn't want that to undermine or crumble their faith, their joy, and their confidence in God. As people who follow Jesus, when death comes, we do grieve. But it doesn't destroy our pervasive and ever-present confidence in God who has us in his hand. Verse 14 says, for seeing that we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. You know, Paul's making the reference here that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Like he mentioned in 1 Corinthians the chapter 15 and verse 20, which says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, and so he is the first of a great harvest, or the first fruits of all who have died. You know, the first fruits in Old Testament times were when the grain uh, first budded and produced its fruit, they would bring the first fruits to God, trusting that there would be a great harvest that would follow after the, after the first fruits, or in the same order as those early fruits and grains that produced from the crops there would be a great harvest that would come afterwards. And Paul is likening Jesus' death and resurrection to being the first fruits. And those of us who trust and believe in him will be the great harvest that comes after that. Verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. You know, there's some things we can't know by experiential knowledge. We, can't, we haven't been through it before. And death is one of those things in the afterlife. It's something that if we know anything about it, we have to receive it by revelation. And Paul says, there is someone who has revealed this to me because he's been through it. And that is Jesus, our Lord. And he said, for this we say unto you, not by our own understanding, this is not something we came up with, but this is a word or message from the Lord. And we can trust Jesus because he's been through it. And he wants them to understand that they don't have to worry, that if they've had loved ones who have died, that they will not proceed, that we will not proceed, those of us who might be living when the Lord returns, we don't have any advantage over those who have died. We will all be together with the Lord when he comes again. And at that, I think I'll stop and turn verse 16 or further comments over to Terry. Well, Steve, I think uh, we've been able to see so far that uh, the reason Paul wrote about this is because there was clearly some confusion in the Thessalonian church and they were questioning that, well, if Jesus is going to come soon and we're all going to have this reunion with him and we're going to go and be with the Lord, well, what, what about our loved ones who, who are already dead? 
are, are they going to miss out on this somewhere or another? Are they not going to be able to participate in it? So they were worried about that. They were concerned about that. And then I think it's also helpful for us to understand some things about the Greco-Roman world and their view of death and the afterlife and, and things like that. You know, as Christians today, when, when we look at this, it would kind of confound us and amaze us almost that, well, why would they be worried about that? They ought to know about the resurrection and everything. But we got to remember, Paul was only there, what, two or three weeks? And mm -hmm. so I don't think Paul had the opportunity to teach everything that he wanted to teach to the Thessalonians. And so because of that, he, he probably had not had time to really elaborate fully on uh, the end times and things like that. And so there's still some things there that, you know, they've heard part of a message. Uh, there are things that they don't know, and so they're confused. They don't really understand exactly what's going on here. And so that's why they're worried. That's why they're upset. That's why they were grieving over those that had already died because somehow or other they had it in their mind that they're not going to be able to participate in the resurrection. And so I think it's important for us to understand that. Now, it's a little bit strange uh, and difficult for us to fully grasp what people were thinking about things 2,000 years ago. And so just generally from what I've uh, done a little research on, uh, the, the, the view of death and the afterlife was kind of all over the place. Uh, there, you could find different ones who believed different things about it. But generally speaking, I think we can be safe in saying that the Greco-Roman world at large had a very dim view of any kind of life after death. While they believed in it, most of them were themselves, I think, confused about it. And so because of their lack of understanding and knowledge and because of their own confusion and ignorance about it, they just felt like it was not very, this isn't, isn't very good. And there wasn't much to look forward to and that, that sort of thing. you have anything you want to say about that? No, I think, uh, I think you're absolutely correct that there was a lot of different views. But uh, like, like we said, nobody knew because nobody had been through it before, at least in the Greco-Roman Empire. <laughs> yeah. And even the Jews, uh, we know from a study of the New Testament, you know, two of the most prominent sects of the Jews, the Pharisees, they believed there was a bodily resurrection. The Sadducees they did not believe that there was a resurrection. So there was even confusion, misunderstanding, undeveloped views uh, among the Jews themselves. So anyway, I think it's helpful for us to understand what the problem was, why Paul is addressing the problem. And so let's uh, continue on here. Verse 16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet him in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. I want to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 beginning in verse 23 because I think that has a lot of bearing on what we're looking at here. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Verse 24 says, after that the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scriptures say God has put all things under his authority. That's, uh, of course, when it says all things are under his authority, that does not include God himself who gave Christ his authority. So, we want to kind of look at these verses together. Uh, they probably are 
I don't know if you could say they're exact parallels, but at the same time, they're certainly talking about the same subject. And I want to impress upon you uh, a cultural kind of thing that we might miss in just reading this. I'd already mentioned to you about the emperor's cult, about the relationship between Rome and the emperor and cities like this. And so occasionally the emperor would make a visit to a city, and the city would get all jacked up and excited and have a big parade. And so citizens of the city would go outside of the city to meet the emperor and his procession uh, way out of town. And then they would escort them into the city. And so it was a going out to greet the king, the emperor, and then they would walk him back into the city and there would be this great celebration and everything like that. That's the imagery that Paul is using here. And so this whole idea of the Lord coming and meeting him in the clouds and forever being with him and everything, that's sort of the social background history of that. Yeah, there's also a lot of uh, Jewish symbolism, references, and imagery as well. Very poetic language. And while we don't always take everything that's poetic as literal, it is mentioned for a reason. It's symbolic for a reason to represent or relay some truth. And there was a lot of Judea, uh, Judea, Judaic uh, tradition that is mentioned and referenced here too. For the Lord himself will descend from the heavens, or from heaven, with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. You know, the, um, let's look at the trumpet of God. That's maybe a reference to um, the convening of the children of Israel at Mount Sinai where God told Moses and the elders to make silver trumpets so that they could call and convene the assembly to come together, to meet God together at, at the mountain. And so the trump of God might be a reference back to those trumpets that were used at Mount Sinai to call and to convene God's people all into one place. And the Lord himself would descend from the heaven. You know, Daniel 7 talks about the Son of Man. Daniel's prophetic language of Daniel 7 is about God's anointed messenger, his Messiah. And it says that the Son of Man will be coming in the clouds. And so we're referencing the Messiah of Daniel's prophecy. We're, re repre we're uh, s referencing the convening of God's people together in one place to meet the Messiah when he comes in the heavens. And uh, so that's kind of an interesting contrast. You can find that in Numbers, the 10th chapter, about the trumpets, and then the, uh, <clears throat> the coming of the Son of Man in Daniel 7. And I thought it was interesting. It says that the Lord himself will descend with a shout. What do you think that shout is? And, and Terry read it also it's, it can also be translated a command. Now, when Jesus comes back to call, to convene the people of God together, what is he going to command? What is he going to shout? You know, it very well could be that he says, let the dead arise. He's calling those in their graves back to life. Do you remember what he said to Lazarus when he stood at the tomb of Lazarus after being dead four days? Lazarus come forth. And what he said to the little girl in Mark the fifth chapter, I say unto you, little girl, arise. And so when Jesus comes back, the reference there is to some things he's already said. Let those who are dead and in their graves come forth, and they, the graves will be empty. Absolutely. We have uh, kept you long enough, I think, I'm going to read a couple of passages of scriptures that go along with this, and then I'm going to turn it over to Steve and talk very briefly just about the comfort level. As most of you know, Steve is a doctor. Uh, he works in conjunction with a hospital, and there are people in his hospital who currently have the coronavirus, and uh, I'd like Steve just to share some thoughts about that. 
uh, in conclusion. So let's look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. And then I'd also like to share with you 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 2. Dear friends, we are already God's children But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. And so there are many passages that talk about the coming of our Lord and what's going to happen and what it's going to be like. Paul wrote these things to the Thessalonians because he knew of their grief, he knew of their concerns, and he also was very confident that if they understood their future, if they understood what Jesus was going to do and how it was going to be when he comes back, that they would be greatly comforted, they would be relieved of the disturbance that uh, they had about whether or not their brothers and sisters who had gone on before them would participate in this glorious reunion. Yeah, Terry, and like he said in verse 17, and thus, whether alive or dead, at the coming of the Lord, we will ever, we will always be with the Lord. That's really what's important with this passage, that whether in life or whether in death, the person who's united with Jesus will forever be with the Lord. And that's a union that can't be broken by death, disease, viruses, or anything else. Comfort, therefore, one another with these words. That was the purpose of his message, to comfort them in tribulation and persecution, even in death and dying. And he's going to say then in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 10, So whether we are awake, alive, or asleep, dead, we are destined to live forever with him. In Jesus, you're destined to be with God the Father and the Lord Jesus forever. But you know something? That's not something that we've got to wait until we die to experience. You can start that right now. You can start by living in the presence of God recognizing his presence in your life and calling upon him every day for support and encouragement. So we encourage you to do that. You know, C.S. Lewis at World War II began delivering some radio messages to encourage people. And the way he encouraged them during a time of World War II when when men were dying right and left and everybody knew somebody who was dying in that war, he gave them radio messages messages weekly to keep them encouraged, to keep them hopeful, and staying the course. And one of the passages that he read in one of those sermons was from Deuteronomy 26 in verse 5, where it said that during the festival of harvest, the first fruits, they would bring their first grain offerings and they would lay it before the priest and before the Lord, and they would recite this, these words, My father was a wandering Syrian or Aramean who was always ready to perish. But God, but God brought him during a time of famine and starvation to Egypt and built him into a magnificent nation, a multitude. And so we are always, every day that we live, we're facing life and death. And for all of us who live, we, there is the potential that death is just around the corner. It's during war and during pandemics that this becomes very real and knowledgeable. So during this time of the pandemic, Paul said to, to a young man, Timothy, something we can learn from too. He said, God did not give us the spirit of fear or timidity, 
But he gave us a spirit of love and power and of a sound mind. So we're called upon to not live in fear, but to have a sound mind to act wisely and to trust in the power of God that no matter what happens, he'll be there to see us through. This pandemic, for many of us, is a great test. It'll be a test of our joyful confidence in God. And while we may have sorrow over loss, suffering, and death, it is not going to destroy our pervasive confidence and joy in the Lord. So I encourage you with those words. And at this point, should we take some questions if there are any? Yeah, there may be some questions. may not be any questions. But uh, we're going to have a sidekick come on up here and uh, <coughs> join us and uh, uh, share with us comments, questions, whatever. And uh, probably be uh, maybe just a few minutes. We, uh, we'll see what happens. And then Joshua closes us out. I hope it's not another guy with great hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was awesome, Steve. Uh, well, first of all, let me share an encouraging word from our sister Martha. She says she is loving what she is learning and hearing from God's words today. So thanks, guys, for sharing. Thank you, today. Martha. Thank you. Um, our first question comes from my favorite listener, uh, Olivia. Olivia. Uh, what does it mean for Christ to reign until everything is put under his feet? Talking about 1 Corinthians 15. When will that be happening? Well, since that's such an easy question, I'm going to give that to Terry. I'm going to take all the hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting question, and, and it's a good question. Um, I believe the Bible teaches us that when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, that death was defeated. God showed his power over death. And while in many respects Satan has a, a kingdom that at least appears to be flourishing, and we live in a time that Romans chapter 7, for example, describes as a law of sin and death. In other words, people everywhere are still sinning and people are still dying. However, God has intervened. God has entered into human history, and he is doing something about this problem. And what he is doing is he is making everything that has gone wrong right. He's doing that through Jesus. He's doing that through Christ's followers. He's doing that through his kingdom. The kingdom of God is here. It is now. It is real. And we are seeing the power of God. And so, Jesus is now Lord. When he ascended, when he rose from the dead and ascended to the heavens, he took his seat on the throne. He is king. He is reigning. He is ruling. And as his subjects, we are ruling and reigning with him. And we are showing the love of Jesus. We are showing the kingdom law of love and the spirit of life every day in all of our actions and all of our deeds. But it's kind of a now and not yet thing. While the kingdom has been ushered in and inaugurated, we're not seeing the full effects of it yet. And so ultimately and finally when the king comes, when he arrives, when all the dead in Christ will be raised from the dead, death ends. It's over. It's finished forever. I hope that answers it. You want to join in, Steve? I don't have anything on that. <laughs> All right. Well, we may have some more uh, questions and comments coming in here. Uh, here's one from uh, Josh. It says, uh, the text says, we don't grieve like those with no hope. What does it look like to grieve as those who do have hope? Well, I will say just one brief thing, and then I'll let Steve address that. I, uh, I, I've done a, a quite a bit of counseling work uh, with grief. And let me just say this about grief. Grief is a very natural, it is a very normal thing. It has uh, stages, and the different people grieve differently. But the question 
makes a very important point that from the text that Christians don't grieve in the same way that unbelievers do. And so I'll let Steve address that. Absolutely. I, I've had a lot of experience with death and dying. I, I do plastic surgery now, but at one point I did head and neck cancer surgery and took care of life-threatening infections as well as life-threatening cancers. And I've had a chance to see many people dying in all different walks and situations of life. And there is a calmness and serenity with those who know that they're going to die, but trust in Jesus and know that there's a life to come, that this is not the end, that we, I don't often see in people who don't have that faith and that hope. Um, there is, uh, I, we have about a dozen people at our hospital, like I said, that have coronavirus now, and there are probably triple that many at some of the other hospitals around town. Um, I have uh, even had a chance to talk with friends and uh, loved ones who have the coronavirus now and are facing death this very moment. And when I spoke to one friend, he said, because his, a big part of his family was being affected by that, he said, we grieve, I'm sorrowful, but I'm not sorrowful like those who have no hope. So he hearkened back to, his, to this very passage we studied today in, in 1 Thessalonians 4 when he thought about the suffering that they're going through right now. But he knew that it's not the end. And so that's, that hope uh, keeps us going and doing the next right thing, whatever that is. You know, we talked about the fact that Jesus is going to make a command or a shout when he comes back. Maybe something like, let the dead arise. But we might shout something back. We might shout the words of 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. But what do we do today? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, since we have this hope in Jesus, let's be steadfast. Let's don't be frantic. Let's don't be intimidated. Let's always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that our toil and our labor in Jesus is not in vain. So what do you do? You trust in God. You keep doing the right thing. And you keep doing the work of the Lord. All right. I think uh, our time's probably about up. Do we have one that just can't, uh, you can't resist? No, we don't have any more uh, All right. on, on the Facebook here, so we should close out. All right. Anything you'd like to say? No, that was good. Thank you, guys. All right. My final word to everyone out there is Maranatha. <laughs> and now here's a word from our beloved Josh. <laughs> our beloved Josh. I want a plaque that says that. That would be great. Uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, I know that all of you are probably uh, just chomping at the bits to know what we're going to call this whole thing. Um, and here is what we have, and let me preface this with, we got a lot of great suggestions. People sent in a lot of good ideas for this stuff. Uh, some of them were humorous. Some of them were really touching. Some of them were dark, yet humorous. <laughs> um, and so we, we have settled on, can I get a drum roll? From a two-person strong drum roll? Okay, cool. Thanks, y'all. Um, the new name is Gather Online. Uh, and the reason that we settled on this is because um, the Bible tells us to not uh, forsake the assembly of the saints, to not stop gathering uh, together uh, as some are in the practice of doing. And uh, right now, we don't really have the choice to get together, um, to be together physically. And this is kind of our best shot at just trying to stay together and to just try to keep on gathering. And so um, that's what we're going to call this from now on is Gather Online, Irving Church, Gather Online. And uh, if everybody hates that, go ahead and comment, and then maybe we can change it again. I don't know. Uh, but I think it'll be all right. Uh, so there is no video tomorrow on Saturday. Uh, we are going to be taking uh, a break for Saturday. We can call it an old Jewish Sabbath or something like that. Uh, and we will see you guys on Sunday morning for our services at 1015. 1015. Y'all have a great day.